Good evening, CGCC. I declare peace to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. I welcome you to another wonderful time in God's presence. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be in the presence of God with trepidation and with awe. I give all thanks to Almighty God for this very rare privilege to serve God's people. I want to sincerely thank the serving overseer, the deputy serving overseer, and the leadership of the church for such a rare and humbling privilege that has been given to me to bring God's word to his people. It's not one that I do take for granted. I celebrate the grace of God upon everyone in the house and especially those that have gone before me. I pray that the grace and the peace of God upon their lives will be multiplied and that the Lord will continually keep them at the center of his will, doing exactly what he has commissioned them for in this season. Tonight, I do not bring you a new message. My assignment is really very simple to consolidate on the multitude of teachings that we have had through the month of August, that through the ex exegesis of the scriptures, we might be built up. We are all teaching on the same theme, and I know that when the Holy Spirit is saying the same thing over and over again, it's because he truly wants to do a new thing. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And tonight I pray, that even as we hear the same words, that the Holy Spirit will breathe upon it afresh and it will give us new interpretation, give us new illumination in the name of Jesus. I want us to take a minute to bow our heads and to say a word of prayer. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for such a time as this. We thank you for your grace that you have made available. The hour has come, I ask that you be glorified. That we ask, Lord, that we submit our hearts to you, that you will teach us, you will instruct us. We know that you are the only one with the ability to give us illumination. Yes, the Bible declares that the entrance of your word giveth light and understanding even unto the simple. And tonight, O oh God, will submit to your tutelage, you who is the wisdom of God, that you will teach us and you will show us great and mighty things that we do not know. And that by tonight's teachings, O oh Lord, that you bring us to new heights and new dimensions in you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, throughout the month of August, we've been looking at a particular theme, and that's at the scent of water, which is taken from the book of Job chapter 14, from verse 7 to 9. But before we dive into Job 14, 7 to 9, I want to give us a quick rundown of the entire book of Job so that we understand where Job was coming from when we get to chapter 14. The book of Job tells us about the righteous man Job who feared the Lord and shunned evil and a man who by the permission of God, the enemy stripped of all that he had, afflicted his body, a man who was pushed to the edge of nothingness and despair so much so that he cursed the day he was born. A man who was surrounded by the multitude of wrong counsel, who accused him insistently of having sinned against God. A man whose very wife said, you know what, just curse God and die. A man who in the midst of his trials and tribulations, God was mostly silent until we get to verse 30, chapter 38 of Job. A man who in the face of all that he was going through, remained steadfast in his faith, in his love and in his hope in God. But most importantly, a man who the Bible says that his later end was greater than the former. The Senate president taught us on the importance of having a solid root and being rooted accurately. He pointed out very profoundly that the deeper your spiritual roots, the stronger you grow. When the time of trial comes, and Rafamuide taught us on the end intended by God. That for everything, there is an intended end. For every trial and tribulation, God has a purpose. He took an extract from the proclamation of a new dawn, the book written by the serving overseer on the four operational dynamics of the tree of life, and finally, on the connectedness of the church as a corporate body. And our deputy senate president taught us on the types of birth, a teaching that I was richly blessed by. She taught us on the supernatural, on the natural birth and our divine parentage and how that we are ingrained in the palms of God and that's part of the benefits of being 
a child of God is that the Holy Spirit is ours. And one of the evidence of us having the Holy Spirit is that we are led by him. And as a result of that leading, our lives are fruitful. Truly speaking, there is a lot of lessons to be learned from the life of Job. And I'd like us at this time to turn our Bibles to Job chapter 14 from verse 7 to 9. The Bible says that for there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. Though its roots may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. Praise the Lord. Job in his distress gave a prophetic analogy and comparison. In Job chapter 7, he was juxtaposing man and a tree. He said that for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down. He might not have realized the import of that statement in the state of distress or the eternal values that that scripture had. If you read the whole chapter, you will see the juxtaposition. I'm very keen on verse 7 to 9, which says that for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down. It means that there is an event preceding the introduction of hope. It says that the condition of the tree before it is before the introduction of hope is that the tree was cut down. And I believe that that is the very first question that we need to ask ourselves tonight. What led to the tree being cut down in the first place? If you are unable to answer this very important question, then the circumstances of events, the same sequence of events that led to the tree being cut down can yet happen again. The tree yet stands the risk of being cut down. And tonight, we are going to be looking at all that and what the hope at the scent of water really is. I want us to know tonight that there are three entities that can't cut down, that can cut us down as trees, that can cut us down as believers. We see the Bible liking a believer in several accounts through scripture to a tree. I want us to open our Bibles to Psalm chapter 1 and we'll read from verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And this is a result of that meditation. The Bible says that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruits in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. I'll also like us to read Jeremiah chapter 17 from verse 7 to 8. The Bible says yet again, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which sprouts out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruits. We have established the similitude of the believer to a tree. It is important to note that there will come a time in everyone's life, in every believer's life, where in our journey, spiritual or otherwise, we will stand the possibility of being cut down. And what determines victory or defeat is hinged upon the salient truths that we'll be looking at tonight. The first entity with the ability to cut down is God. And I'll show you that in the book of John chapter 15 from verse 1 to 8. The Bible says that I am the true vine. Jesus Christ speaking here. I am the true vine and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That he may work, that it may bear much fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, it says, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. 
and they, ga and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But this, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Praise the Lord. It is clear according to the scripture that God, Jesus Christ speaking says that God is the vine dresser. It is the responsibility of the vine dresser to do to the vine how he pleases. He cuts branches so that the vine might bear much fruit or he takes away the branches that are unfruitful. According to the scripture, Jesus Christ himself is telling us that there are two types of branches. One is the branch that bears fruit. And second is a branch that does not bear fruit. And he also tells us the causes and effects of each one of those branches. He says, for the branch that bears fruit, it is pruned so that what? It can bear more fruit. And the branch that does not bear fruit, it is what? It is taken away by God, the vine dresser. There are different reasons why God can take his children through pruning and cutting. He can be taking you through different stages of pruning for your own glory to make you bear much fruit. He can be cutting away pride in your life. He can be cutting away anything that does not allow you to bear much fruit. So the number one person with the ability to cut down is God. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 3, he says that an axe is laid down at the foot of any tree that does not bear fruit. It also says the same thing in the book of Matthew chapter seven. So we see clearly according to the scriptures that God has the ability for his intended purpose to cut, to prune, and to trim, that we might bear much fruit. And I'd like us to know again, if you look through the book of Job, who is our case study for the month, you see he's a clear example of God cutting or God pruning. What was the intention? What was the purpose of the trial of Job? Was God trying to gain entertainment through taking Job through that trial? Was God trying to entertain the devil? Was God bored? No. God was taking him through a pruning for his glory. The Bible also says that our temporary affliction is bought for a moment. In the book of, I think it's Corinthians, it said, walking in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So if it is God who is doing the cutting, if it is God who is doing the pruning, it is for two reasons. It's either you are unfruitful or he's pruning you that you may bear much fruit. And the second entity with the ability to cut is the devil. There are several ways in which the devil attempts to cut a believer. And one of such ways is through ignorance. The devil attempts to keep the children of God in ignorance because he knows that if you do not know, then you are easy to manipulate. So he keeps us ignorant of the word of God. He keeps us ignorant of the will of God. He keeps us ignorant of the purposes and the counsel of God. So yes, we are born again and we are God-loving people. But do we really know what the will of God is? Do we really know what the purpose of God is? I'll show us an example <laughs> in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says that be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. As a roaring lion. And you see in Job chapter 1, verse 7, and Job chapter 2, verse 2, God asks him, so where are you coming from? And the devil says, ah, I'm coming from to and fro the earth, walking about on it. What is he doing? Looking for praise. And his greatest tool is ignorance. An ignorant Christian is a powerless Christian. If you don't know what God has ordained you to do, if you don't know what God has called you and commissioned you to do, part time, per season, you are but a prey in the hands of the enemy. The Cambridge Dictionary defines Ignorance as being destitute of knowledge. It also defines it as lacking knowledge or comprehension of a thing that has been specified. Hmm. The Bible says in the book of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, that my people are destroyed for lack 
of knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18, it says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance. So ignorance alienates you from the life of God. And that is the goal of the enemy, to alienate us from the life of God. He says, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. And I particularly love Psalms chapter 82 from verse 5 to 7. I'd like us to turn our Bibles there quickly. Psalms 82 from verse 5 to 7. The Bible says that they do not know, neither do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundation of the earth are unstable. Can you see? It says that the foundation of the earth is unstable because of the ignorance of the children of God. He said that all the foundations of the earth are unstable. And I said, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. But here is the tragedy. He says, but you shall die like men. And fall like one of its princes. A translation says that you shall die like mere men. And fall like one of its princes. It says that you are gods and children of the most high. But because of your ignorance, because you do not know. It says that you shall die like mere men. I pray that the Lord will help us. Not just to be believers. Not just to be God loving. Not just to come to church and lift up holy hands, but that we'll receive light and understanding in our hearts. Paul says that, that we'll apprehend the very reason why Christ apprehended us. To know without a shadow of doubt what God has called us to do and to walk in the fullness of that purpose. Light in this kingdom is very powerful because we rise on the strength of the level of spiritual understanding that we have. It takes more than a sincere desire to excel in this kingdom. To your desire, you must add knowledge. To your desire, you must add light and illumination. God does not want us to be a church that is ignorant of what he would have us do as a corporate body in this time and in this season. The Bible says that we have been called and we have been predestined. To be predestined simply means that God has not released us without a purpose. And the fact that he has released us means that there is a specific purpose and what he has called us to be doing on the face of the earth. I pray that the Lord will help us. No wonder Paul said to the church in Ephesus, said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know. What is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints? I know that a lot of times we read that scripture, we understand it to be that our own inheritance in God. Yes, while we have an inheritance in God, the Bible does say that we are co-heirs, joint inheritors with Christ. But this particular scripture in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 is not talking about our own inheritance in God. It's talking about God's inheritance in us. What is God's reward? What is the reward of God on his investment in our life? God has invested so much in us. He has equipped us with so much in our DNA, our marvels and wonders of God. And what is God? God's reward. This is what the scripture is talking about. That we might know what the riches of his inheritance in us is. And I pray that the Lord will help us and bring us to the truth of this word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And the third entity with the ability to cut down is you. Yes, you yourself. We can by ourselves alienate us, alienate us from the life of God. And one of the ways through which we do that, there are a lot of ways, but the one I want to talk about this evening is through disobedience. What is disobedience? Disobedience simply is the willful rejection of God's instructions or command. Willfully disobeying what God has said. And I will show us an example in the book of Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1 to 24. It's a long read, so stay with me. Genesis chapter 3, from verse 1 to 24. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had, God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God said, Indeed, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. So when the woman saw, that the tree was good for food, that it was, a, it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the Bible says that then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. I want you to take note of that. He said that they hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Let's stop there for now. The Bible says that God gave them an instruction that they should not eat of the tree which was in the midst of the garden. And the serpent came and said, has God said? Invariably, he said, God knows that in the day that you eat, you shall be like him. What, what, what did he use to deceive Eve? He said that you shall be like him. Was that desire in itself wrong? No. We as children of God today, we are striving to be like Christ. That I may know you. That we will be more like him. The Bible says that but we all with open faces beholding are changed into the same image. We walk to be like Christ on a daily basis. And this is what the devil said to Eve. That he knows that in the day that you eat, you shall be like him. So what was the problem? Eve's desire in itself singly was not wrong in itself. Because that is what we are doing today. But she did that in disobedience. The Lord God said, thou shalt not eat. And even though she had a sincere desire to be like God, she disobeyed a simple commandment and she ate. And we can see the resultant effect of that disobedience. The Bible says that man fell and God sent them out of the garden. And he put an angel with a flaming sword that goes both ways to guard the garden. He said, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. I want you to know that God sending Adam and Eve out of the garden was not an act of punishment. God was not trying to punish them for their disobedience. In that very instant, God was already working a restoration plan. Because the Bible says that he said, unless they eat of the tree of life and live forever. Now what the tree of life does is that it seals you up in a particular spiritual state forever. So if man in his fallen state have eaten of the tree of life, what will happen by default is that man will become irredeemable. So for the sake of redemption, that at the scent of water we might live again, God sent them out of the garden and preserved his restoration plan. The cost of disobedience. I will thank God for the last Adam who came and brought restoration to us. We, through our disobedience, can alienate ourselves from the life of God. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 14, verse 15, it said that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me. So the proof that you love God is that you are keeping his commandments. Now, the expression of love is important. You know, we can say, I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. The expression of love is important. It's beautiful. But much more than the expression is the obedience of love. If you love him, you would keep his commandments. Now to the core of today's teaching. I failed to introduce the topic at the beginning. 
the topic of today's teaching, what we are teaching on the team at the scent of water, our topic is the foundational source of the believer. The foundational source of the believer. And what is the foundational source of the believer? The foundational source, brothers and sisters, is the spirit and the word. The scripture, our team says that at the scent of water, it will bud, that the plants will bud. Now, what is the importance of water to plants? Why is water so important to plants? In crop production, I did a little bit of research and I found that in crop production, water is an important climatic factor. It affects or determines plant growth and development. Its availability or scarcity can mean a successful harvest, a diminution in yield, or a total failure. Water carries nutrients and organic compounds to the plants. Water comprises much of the living protoplasm in the cells. Now, just like water to plants, there are foundational sources, key elements that are important to the life and sustenance of a believer that when taken away are detrimental to the overall health, especially the spiritual health of a believer. And those foundational sources are the spirit and the word. Jesus Christ in the book of John chapter 15 that we read in the beginning says that abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Invariably what Jesus Christ through that scripture is telling us that we have no existence outside of him. We are nothing outside of God. We cannot exist without God. Hmm. We are not made to function without God. We're going to look at the first foundational source, which is the spirit, the presence of God. Water is a symbolic representation of the expressions and the functions of the Holy Spirit. The scripture liking the Holy Spirit to water, to river in several accounts. I want us to open our Bibles to John chapter 4 from verse 13 to 14. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whosoever, this, is, this verse is talking about Jesus Christ and the woman of Samaria. So Jesus Christ, she came to fetch water from the well of Jacob. And Jesus said to her, a conversation ensued between both of them. And in the midst of that conversation, Jesus said to her, he said that whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never test. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up unto eternal life. Hmm. I want us to open to John chapter 7 from verse 37 to 39. John chapter 7, on this last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this has spoke concerning who? The Bible says concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we can see that in, according to these two scriptures, we have established that the Holy Spirit is likened to water. One of the expressions of the function of the Holy Spirit is water. The water, the Holy Spirit purifies us. He refreshes us. He revitalizes us, satisfies our chest and gives us life. The servant of Asiya has taught us that when God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, he gave us his best. But when he gave us his spirit, when he gave us the Holy Spirit, he gave us his all. We must sincerely desire the very presence of God. I don't know what a believer is without the presence of God. In fact, I can't begin to define it. What we are without God's presence. When you see a man in whom the spirit of God richly dwells, you don't need, prof you don't need prophecy to design it. When you see a man that is overfull with the presence of God, 
You can easily tell it's palpable. The presence of God is tangible. You can almost touch it. You can take a hold of it. God is calling us to fellowship. He is creating a desire in us for his presence. And it is our duty to respond to that desire. There is a level of the presence of God that compels from you a response that you didn't even want to give. We'll see in the Sons of Solomon, chapter 5, from verse 1 to 6. The Bible tells us that the lover came and stood by the door and he called out to his love. And he said, open for me. And she said, I have taken off my clothes. I am now in my night dress. Shall I take on my clothes again? I have washed my feet and I lay on my bed. Shall I come down and soil my feet again? And while she was contemplating, the Bible says that he stood outside. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He stood outside and his purposes were suspended. And while she was contemplating about the kind of sacrifice it was going to take her to respond to her lover, the Bible says that he held the door, the knob of the door, and that the oil from his hand flowed to the other side and began to drip. And there was such an overwhelming presence, the sweetness of his fragrance. And it filled the room. The Bible says that she jumped down from her bed. Everything that was a curse was no longer a curse because of the compelling presence of his presence, of his spirit. So she jumped down from her bed and took on her coat and she ran to the door and she opened. The same sacrifices became nothing. She ran to the door and she opened. And the Bible tells us that he was no longer there. Ah. May we not respond late to the call of God. May we not be late and slow to respond to God. I want us to take a song if you know it. I want you to sing it with me. It says, The one I love is ever before me. He seals upon my heart. I live for the one I love. The one I love is ever before me. He seals upon my heart. I live for the one I love. I respond to the one I love. I respond to the one I love. I respond to the one I love. The presence of God is sweet. Ah, to stay in the presence. No wonder. David said, he said, that one thing have I desired, that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord. One thing have I desired. But Paul then says to you, he said that to you and I, it is no longer your desire. He says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the living God. God now dwells in us. The presence of God. There is nothing that can be compared to it. You know, I remember an encounter that I had. Back in school, we had just come back from Bible study, as you would have it, my best friend and I. And we went back to our hostel. And we were just ruminating on the Bible study we just had. We, were, we just kept sharing scriptures and singing. We love to do that then. We are just singing. And after a while, we just said our good night and laid to bed. And I remember I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw a man standing and I was standing with him. And we're having a conversation, you know, like friends will have a conversation and have a discussion. We're standing and we're gisting. And though I couldn't make out the features of his face clearly, I could tell that he was smiling. It was a pleasant conversation. I couldn't, he wasn't speaking in English, but I could hear him in that dream. And I would respond and he would hear me. We were having that interaction onto a time. And it was like he was saying, oh, you know the way you bid your body goodbye? Okay, see you later, catch you, that kind of thing. I was, he said goodbye to me in that dream. And I, I started becoming conscious of my environment again, that I was still lying in my bed. But I realized that I was praying in the Holy Ghost from my spirit. I was praying in tongues from my spirit. And that day, there was such an overwhelming joy in my heart. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Ghost. There was such an overwhelming joy in my heart. Such a presence in the room that day. And I remember that I prayed in the Holy Ghost until the morning. 
such an encounter. The presence of God is a place of, of encounters. I'm not saying this to impress anybody. I'm telling you so that you know that when you come to his presence, there are encounters. And encounters are what will keep you in the day of adversity. If you do not have an encounter with God, when the storm comes, the storm can blow you to and fro. Saul had an encounter on his way to Damascus and nobody, nothing could take that encounter away from him. Not even when he faced death face to face. An encounter. The presence of God is a place of encounters. We must sincerely desire that very presence of God. We must come to that place where we long to be cleansed, to be washed by the river of God. I'll show us a story in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. The Bible says that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, I want us to first understand from that verse 8, he said that God created, he planted a garden eastward of Eden. It means that Eden was a larger geographical location than the garden. The garden was not Eden. But the garden was planted in the location that the Bible says is eastward of Eden. Verse 9. It says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. I'm going to capitalize on the scripture. But if you read the whole of Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells you that it begins to tell you the account of creation. That God made out of the ground every living thing that lives in the ground. And God made out of the sea every living creature that lives in the sea. So it says that God planted a garden eastward of Eden. And there he put the man whom he had made. <clears throat> the east of Eden, brothers and sisters is the point where heaven meets earth. The east of Eden is the point where Eden and the garden touched. The Bible says that out, God made everything to function within the environment from which he took it. God made everything to function within the environment from which he took it. So he said, out of the ground comes every living thing that lives on the ground. And out of the sea comes every living thing that lives in the sea. Notice that God did not need to breathe into them the breath of life for them to live. Informing them, they lived. He just said, let out of the sea come every living thing that lives in the sea. And voila, every sea creature was made. And out of the ground, every living creature. And then he said, and God, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and it says and he breathed into him the breath of life it then means that the breath of life is not oxygen if every living thing was already living without needing the breath of life it means that the breath of life is not oxygen why did god breathe into adam the breath of life i dare say to you that it is possible that Adam was already breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide before the Lord breathed into him a breath that was higher than oxygen and carbon dioxide. It then means that if God made everything to function within its natural habitat, it then means that man then needed more than the dust of the earth to live. So God needed to create a supernatural existence where that which is the breath of life intercepts with that which is the dust of the earth. Are you following me this, this evening? God needed to create a point of interception with, between that which is spiritual and that which is natural. So God created a point in the earth which is the east, which is the east of that Eden. <laughs> and Adam became a living being. The Bible tells us that the breath of life was what God breathed into him. What is that breath of life? I ask you, brothers and sisters. Was it oxygen? We have established that it's not. 
is the breath of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one God needed to create a point where he could interface, where he, can, where he could have communication spirit to spirit with Adam. God needed to create a point where he can come to have fellowship with Adam, God to God. Ye are gods, the Bible said. Hmm. So God creates, caused a heavenly existence to intercept an earthly natural existence. That heavenly existence is what is called Eden. The east of that heavenly existence is where the Eden touched the earth. Why is that so difficult to understand? The Bible says that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It means that there is a point of interception between heaven and earth. Now, for you to understand the river, you need to read it from the book of Genesis chapter 2, where we just read, Ezekiel 47, and Revelation chapter 22. The Bible says that that river issued out of the altar. That's where God is. And that in Revelation chapter 22, it says that that river issued out of the throne of God. So needless to say that the river went out of Eden to water the garden. And it was from that Eden that the Bible says that it broke into four river heads. The Gihon, the Pishon, the Hidekel, and the Euphrates. Now remember that Jesus Christ in the accounts with his interaction with the woman of Samaria, he said that if you know who it is that asks you for a drink, you yourself will ask him for a drink because the water that I shall give you, not only will you not thirst again, the Bible says that out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. So God wants to flow in and out of your life. He wants to flow into you and through you break forth into the earth. Ha. God wants you to be a conduit of his presence. He wants you to be a conduit and a point where the heavens meet the earth. Now, if our piece of flesh, if our piece of earth is where God is glorified, I ask you a question this evening. How much of intercession is happening between heaven and earth where you stand? When you make your life that place, the river, the flow from Eden, where God is, has to pass through your life and then break into the earth. As you stay connected to that river that flows from the throne of God, as you stay connected to that river that flows from the altar, as you stay planted by that water, that your life, my life, will become a point where the heaven meets the earth. The Bible says that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That if you are led by the Spirit of God, you will always be at the center of his will. Hmm. The second foundational source of the believer is the word of God. Water also symbolizes, is also a symbolic representation of the word of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 that he makes sanctify, let's read it, that he makes sanctify and cleans her with the washing of the water by the word. With the washing of the water by the word. Then in the book of James chapter 1 verse 23 to 25, the Bible says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The word of God is also symbolically represented by water. Now, what is the word of God? The word of God is the very manual of the life of the believer. We nothing started without the word. John says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God is the very beginning of everything. The word is the very beginning of all that ever existed. The Bible says that without him was not anything made that was made. So you see in the book of Genesis chapter one, it says, and God said, the spoken word, let us, and God said, and in the account of the creation of man, he said, and God said, let us make man. So the word is the beginning of everything that ever existed. But James, where we read, says that looking yourself in a mirror, you observe yourself in a mirror and immediately forgetting what you look like. Now, the problem is not that we forget what we look like. 
The problem is that we fail to make the necessary adjustment that is needed for our growth. The word of God is meant to ethically adjust us. The word of God is meant to transform us. He said that be not conformed to the word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And your mind is only renewed by the word of God. Pastor has taught us that you can create your own world with your words. You can create your own world. If it is the word that brought the world into existence, it means that the world can also recreate. So it doesn't matter what you're seeing in your life that you don't like. With the word of God in your mouth, you can recreate. You can change your reality. I'll tell you a story. How that the word can bring, for, can bring forth. It's a story of my grandmother. After she had gotten married to my grandfather, for the first few years of their marriage, she was barren. She couldn't conceive of a child. And she was mocked by women in the village. She was mocked by family members. Oh, look at that barren woman. After how many years she cannot conceive? Who knows what she must have done and this and this and that. And yes, there are times where she will feel distressed that God, what is happening? And she had the prayer partner who they always agreed together as touching anything. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. So she had a prayer partner with whom she always agreed on anything. And they began to pray. And the word of the Lord came to her. And the word of the Lord said, I have not made you barren, that I shall give you a son. And he shall be a servant unto me. Now for you to know that it is I who has given you the son. This is the sign that you shall know. He said you shall, number one, you shall call his name Samuel. And number two, he said that when he is born, his left feet shall be inverted. Meaning his feet shall be turned backwards. And that is the sign that I will give you for you to know that I was the one that gave you this child. Now in the fullness of time. Now God did not specify when. I can tell you that even after she received that word, it did not stop the mockery of men. It did not stop the accusation of men. She still went about a few months or a couple of years carrying that plaque, barren. But she had the word of the Lord and that kept her rooted. You see, if you have the word of the Lord, I do not care what season of life that you are in, you can overcome. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, where we read in the beginning, he said that you shall be like a tree planted by the river and you shall fear, you shall not fear the heat and you shall what? You shall not be anxious in the year of drought. He says, no, will, your, will you cease from yielding fruit? So it doesn't matter what season of life that you are in. As long as you are connected to the spirit and the word, you shall overcome that season. The word of God in your mouth is as powerful as the word of God in the mouth of God. Are you speaking the word of God? No, first. Do you know what the word of God is saying? Do you know what God is saying to you per time, per season? There is the spoken word. There is the written word. And there is the revealed word. The Bible says that the letter kills, but the spirit is what gives life. That as you begin to read and meditate on the word, the psalmist says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may meditate therein day and night. The word of God. I know a lot of us read it religiously. We do it, okay, some of us don't even open our Bibles until Sunday when pastor says, shall we open our Bibles too? And then we read. But the psalmist says, that the word have I hidden in my heart that I may meditate therein day and night. You see, that's what Sister Modupe was trying to teach us last week. What we read in the book of James, chapter 23, verse 25. He said that it, it's not just the, the fruit of the spirit. It's not just talking about the physical, the spiritual fruits. It's not just talking about the spiritual fruits. That as you study the word of God and make the necessary ethical adjustments, that your life is changed. That your life is changed. The Bible says that, but we all, with open faces, Beholding as in a glass the glory of God, that we are what? Are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. 
that when you come and you behold what the word of God has said concerning you, you go back into your closet, into your everyday life and you make the necessary adjustments and you come and you behold again and you see what the word of God has revealed to you that you are and you go back and you make the necessary adjustments and you come back and you behold. That is how you are changed from glory to glory. But we all, we don't build faces. Melancholia. The psalmist also says in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verse 5, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my part. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, desire the sincere milk of the word, of the word that you may grow thereby. That you may grow thereby. <laughs> so now, brethren, Acts 20 says that I commend you to the word of God, to God and to the word of his grace, which is what, number one, able to build you up. So the word has capacity in itself to build. That the word of God is able to build you up and it says to do what? To give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, this is talking about our own inheritance in God. That the more we behold him, the more we are like him. That the more we become all that God wants us to be. And that is where God is glorified. That is how we bear fruits in this kingdom. The word builds up. The word gives you an inheritance. The word cleanses. The word equips. The word grounds. The word transforms. So what then is the conclusion of the matter? I showed us in the book of Genesis where I referenced that God said, let us. Creation started with the word of God. The creation of man started with the word of God. And God said, let us make man. And it was perfected. That creation was perfected by the breath of the Almighty. And God breathed into him, the scripture says, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Adam, through his disobedience, lost that connection to God. But God, in Christ, through perfect obedience, restored us back to himself. And then he says, he says that he has not just restored us, but he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Go ye into the world and make disciples of all nations. It is our responsibility as those who have stayed in the presence of God, who have been taught and tutelaged by the word, that the word has become even flesh on our inside, that the word has crystallized, that we are to go into the world and make disciples of the nation. Remember, he did, I want you to say, to know that he did not say that you should go and get them repented. He said that you should make disciples. So we are to make mature men. The discipline of a person is different from the conversion. So you can't be converted, you can't be born again, but you are not discipled. He said that we should make disciples of all nations. Now this is the commission. I want to help somebody tonight. If you don't know what your purpose is, if you don't know what your will is, this is one of it. Our generic purpose as, a belief, as the body of Christ, that we go into the world and we begin to impact them with the cultures of the kingdom. And we begin to impact them with the kingdom doctrine that we displace every demonic doctrine and bring people to the fullness of Christ. The Bible says, it says that casting down imaginations and every high thing that seeks to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. How do you cast them down? By sound doctrine. That through the exegesis of the scripture, not only are we built up, but we have the capacity in ourselves to build others up, make disciples of all nations that are the scent of water, irrespective of what they have gone through in their lives, irrespective of what the world is saying, that once the introduction of the spirit and the world is made, that it is able to bring a transformation. That is the hope that Job was talking about in the book of, in, in chapter 14. He said that at the scent of water, it will burn. I do not care what season of life you are in. I don't care what got you to where you are. But if you can connect yourself again to the spirit and the word, I declare to you that you will come alive yet again. This is the conclusion 
of the matter. We are to bring the message of hope to the hopeless. Irrespective of their past or what the enemy has, how the enemy, enemy has kept them captive. The purposes of God will not wait for us forever. There are lives and nations that are dependent on it. There is a time limit and we cannot permit our own considerations or even the respect for the opinion of men to stop us. We can't permit even how much we love our own lives. The Lord is standing at the door and is knocking today. And I pray that we will receive grace to answer. This is the conclusion of the matter. That at the scent of water, as long as the spirit and the word is present, there is no situation that is hopeless. There is no situation that is without the possibility for a turnaround. You only need to introduce the spirit and the word. The psalmist says, one thing have I desired, that I will I seek after, that I may dwell in the presence of God. I pray that the Lord will help us tonight. I want us to bow our heads in prayer for one minute and just say, Father, grant me the grace to respond to you. Grant me the grace to seek your face. Bring me back to the place of the study of your word, that I will be full of your word, that when the day of trouble comes, that my strength will not fail. Grant me an encounter. Don't feel me that, that as I stay in the place of the word, that as I stay in your presence, he says, and I call Sabbatia, he says that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. He didn't say he that visits her. Grant me the grace to abide her, that I will have a desire for your presence, that I will have a desire for your word. Renew in me, O oh God, a desire. Let there be a stirring in my heart, that there will be a fresh staring for your presence and your word in the name of Jesus that as we are equipped as we are built up oh God you grant us the grace to dispense that same grace to others in the name of Jesus that will bring about a change the Bible says that out of your belly shall flow Lord let my belly begin to flow with rivers of living water in the name of Jesus rivers of healing rivers of restoration in the name of Jesus rivers of of that is able to change cultures and infiltrate it with the cultures of the kingdom. We'll bless your name, Abba Father. We'll give you praise. I don't know if you know the song, but I just want to sing it in closing. It says, Out of my bellies shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. I, I, Hey, out of my belly hey, shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. I, I, let it flow, 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 flow, let it flow right here, right now. Caradosa. As the river flows, yeah, it brings everything that are back to life. It's a life-giving river out of the river. Let it flow right now. That we ask that you will flow in and through us and that our lives will become that fruitful garden. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. <laughs>